Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria. I need more, man! I just need a little bit more! We're gonna talk more about World vs. World and all of the updates from the recent beta. Stay tuned, it's coming right up. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're all in withdrawal. Everybody in the chat room saying, I need more beta weekend events. Welcome one, welcome all to the Guild Wars 2 podcast known as Tales of Tyria. You can find us at talesoftyria.com. I am Bridger. I'll be your host this evening. Thank you for joining us. Tell a friend or two, won't you? Firstly, I very quickly want to thank the last uh, people for donating over the last month and a half, and I keep meaning to thank you guys, and it keeps slipping under my radar because i got a thousand things to do right before the show starts. And wait a minute. I did remember to clean up my room this week. It's good team. Okay, thank you for donating. Robert, James, Michael, Tim, Robin, and Christopher. Christopher, Robin. Did Winnie the Pooh just donate to us? I don't know. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> and if you feel like donating, there is a link on the right-hand side of the website to donate via PayPal. Thank you very much for those guys who did. We definitely appreciate it. And actually, very soon you should see some updates uh, on the show's quality uh, that we're going to be using that money for. So it's going to be, it's gonna be uh, some pretty awesome stuff. So stay tuned. All right. Don't forget to check out uh, our feedback at talesofteria.com as the email that's not something to check out that's something to send all right <clears throat> let me introduce the rest of the team here we've got vega welcome to the show sir good evening how you doing can you save me from this train wreck of an intro <laughs> i i would appreciate it I sir i mean you... I, I i wish i could <laughs> <laughs> it's already over that's it we're the restarting the whole dealt. thing all right freelancer welcome how's it going Berger? Not bad, not bad. And great. Also on the show here today, filling in for Kai. Thank you, sir. Hello there. Glad to be back. So, we had a lot of great feedback from last week's show, I've got to say. Uh, so, first of all, last week I know I mentioned that you couldn't draw on the world map when it was in full screen, apparently. I was wrong, uh, because about a thousand people sent in emails to the fact that when clicking on uh, the map, you can actually draw on it. In addition, if you shift click on a waypoint, it makes a text link in the chat, which is kind of cool, so that people can, I, I assume, click on that and open the world map to the point where they're clicking, or maybe just click on that to go there. And it says, you know, do you want to pay the 13 copper to go here or something? That seems like a really cool feature. So thank you to uh, Wee Poner and ZZ87 Pull, amongst many others. But those are the first ones to get it into me. So, also had Dave hit us up with a bit of feedback here. Uh, he said that we had mentioned uh, having, uh, actually, this was actually a uh, feedback to Great and Freelancer here. He said, Quote, in Tales of Tyria show prior to the beta weekend, two of your hosts, Freelancer and Great, had mentioned that they previously had the intention of spending 100% of their time in structured PvP. Freelancer had even made the statement that he thought everyone <laughs> should be doing the same. What was different about World vs. World and structured PvP that, from what you expected that made you decide to instead spend all your time in World vs. World? Unquote. <laughs> Oh, Great, wow. you could take this one first. <laughs> I mean, I, I shot to the David next email, nurse. but I'm just like... I don't really know how I ended up there. I was expecting <laughs> to be like, all right, hardcore PvP, let's go. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, let's go do World vs. World. And I just, next thing I knew, it was like 4.30 in the morning. And I'm like, oh, okay. I guess that's a good sign then, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Freelancer, well, what's, what's like your excuse? Great. I have a guild to lead. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unfortunately, we had done so many... Uh, practice sessions over the year it, it like when we got into worldly world and like if i'm not there they didn't it, we had very few uh chiefs and too many indians if you get what i'm saying so 
uh, it was it was one of those things we had to practice this, practice that. We had these tactics to execute, these tactics. And I had been kind of the central point for all of the tactics. So it's like I had to be there to show them how to do them properly. So, and uh, we also just – we. I, when I got in there, because I started in structure PvP, but when I got in there, I just got so enveloped in the in the sieges. You know, we we set up our trebuchets, and the first time I saw trebuchets flying across the sky, I'm like, hours went by. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I got addicted. So we went on this mass rampage of taking point to point and rolling over Zerg and Zerg. And uh, when you when you have a group of like, we started with like 30 to 40 people. When you have a group of like 30 people that annihilate a group of 60 people you will never get over that it's like it's like a <laughs> like a drug yep. you know it's like you get like that crazed look in your eye you <laughs> are <it's>... <laughs> sylvester stallone in so Siege once you Man. once you learn how to take the, yeah once you learn how to take these zergs on it's like every time you're, you're looking for them and you want to hit the next keep hit the next keep and draw even more zergs it, i i got addicted very fast uh i i am guilty i i was wanting to do structured pvp but uh worldly world's awesome man Awesome. Uh, awesome is putting it lightly. <laughs> it's it's just the most... It's like the one thing that the beta weekend definitely showed us all that is like on track. All right, yeah. hang on, hang on. Nope, nope, I can't find it. There was a great video I found somewhere over the past week that was basically uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this group of five guys. What they saw was a, a bridge that led out to like an outpost on the tower. So imagine a tower enclosed with a little, little, little thing. And then there's a bridge that goes to this little tower. And there's no reason for it that the Keep Lord isn't on the tower, but the bridge is highlightable like you can destroy it. And they're like, oh man, I wonder what happens when you blow up that bridge. I bet the bridge collapses and then you can run up to the wall or something. And they just, they <laughs> sat there for 15 minutes and somebody was in the background the whole time saying, you know what, guys? I bet you when you blow the bridge up, it just blows the bridge up and nothing else happens. And they're like, no, man, no way, man. There's no way that they would put that bridge there and then just have it be destroyable because it doesn't allow you to have access to anything. It just stops people from getting to this tower. And so there was this, this 15 minutes of this back and forth with one catapult slowly, and then people came <laughs> up when they were about this close to finishing it. And they're like, no, we need to find out what happens. And then they chased them off, and they finally got to it, and they did the last shot, and the bridge just collapsed and stranded two enemies on top of this tower and they were just like wait where do we go so <laughs> apparently that <laughs> destroying that bridge does absolutely nothing for you it's just there to say see see how realistic the game is <laughs> wow. oh man you gotta admit that the, the, the over whoever's in the tower <laughs> You gotta admit that the destruction of walls and stuff, like when oh, you were there yeah. at that Dreaming Bay Battle Bridger and you saw that wall right in front of you just collapse, was that not the coolest thing ever? That was I the mean. coolest thing ever. And it's a really fantastic dichotomy, I guess you could say, because if you want to get in some place quick, if you think, okay, let's do this like ninja style, they won't know we're coming, we're just get in there, hit it and get out before anybody or, or defend it or whatever, before they can get here. You go to the door, you come and bring in siege golems, you bring in rams, you hit that thing down, boom, done, in and out. But if it's heavily defended, the doors are usually really hard to, to, to really get if there's somebody dropping all kinds of stuff on you, if they've got arrow carts on the doors and everything like that. So the only possibility at that point is is to try to knock down a wall from long range. And that just brings a whole different... It's like two completely different types of battles in the game. It's really cool. Anyway, we're... Whoa. Getting way off on a tangent that's supposed to happen <laughs> at the end of the show. I'm sorry. Uh, but we do have one more piece of feedback that also has to do with World vs. World. Last week, we did ask for your World vs. World stories. And Grant sent us the best one so far. He says, quote... So I was leveling through the char area as a thief. I ran into a guy playing as an elementalist. We partied a difficult event together, then played together for a few hours after that. During that time, we discovered a couple of cool cross-profession combos, two of which were that I could use the smokescreen ability and then the elementalist could use dragon tooth to give everyone in the area invisibility. The other was that the elementalist could use healing rain and I could unload to do massive healing to all of my allies in fire range. So the next day I'm playing World vs. World with my guild, and we're fighting to take control of a tower and we're starting to lose. All of a sudden he shows up out of nowhere, with no communication from me, he drops down a healing rain right in front of me and I unload to keep the majority of my guild alive. I then go into the <laughs> thick of battle as we are starting to be pushed back and drop a smoke screen and the elementalist used Dragon Tooth to apply stealth to all the melee, giving us a chance to retreat and regroup. We were eventually able to take that tower. 
Thank you, Grant. That was a fantastic story. It um, really was. That's awesome. That's a good story. Yeah. It's 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 always awesome to be like have have like th- those stories where the cavalry rides up, right? Did you guys have anything like that happen at World versus World? Uh, we I were the really... cavalry all the time. <laughs> Is that the trick well, I do say? It... Well, you guys so have mobile, group, we you might as really well have the cavalry. Uh. All right, so before we get to the more World vs. World stuff, because, again, we're going to talk about this forever, let's get into the news this week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a whole mess of links from the past week, obviously. Now, the first one is a video, which is a highly skilled engineer with a bomb kit. And this one is just crazy. Everybody's like, see see how the engineer is overpowered? I told you so. And other people are like, yeah, well, this guy's just good. Uh, it, it's it's kind of worth checking out. Uh, I watched a little bit of it myself, and it got a lot of big upvotes on Reddit and other places like that. So if you guys want to check out what an engineer doing with well played looks like, this is the one to uh, to look at. There, Vega, did you see this video? Yeah, there's another one. I think from the same guy. Um, he had a different build. Instead of going, um, or maybe he just in, he had different utility skills. He had the uh, the oil slick shoes. And he literally downed, um, I think it was three people Whoa! in a matter of like Look at all those two, two minutes. <laughs> all right, so if you guys was, want to check that ridiculous. out. There was also a warrior video flying around of some warrior that was getting like two hit kills or something like that ridiculous with a, with a super crit build or something. So obviously a lot of balancing to do. Uh, moving on, this is a really cool series of videos, I have to say. Have you guys seen these two videos put out by this one guy, uh, Kara M? Yeah, is that where he explains like sort of the complexity, like sort of the things that go under the surface of dynamic events, like behind the scenes in a way? Yeah, and, and he, he used, for example, the, the one in the, the Norn area with the guy that uh, asks you to get all the meat for him, and then uh, the bear attack comes and the kids yes, with the, the snowballs. It's, it's a crazy amount. Like, he's like, oh, so I decided to follow this guy. And he then narrates everything that goes on, and you see everything that happens in the background. And if we cut to later on in the video, but it's totally worth watching the whole thing, by the way. He shows you, okay, here's what's happened when he gets back. His, his kid comes and asks to borrow this honey. And then, if you, and then if you follow that kid around, you'll see one thing happen. And then if you follow this kid around, something else entirely happens. And he ends the video by saying, who would have thought that a simple comment about a wife going out to you know to the market ends with a bear invasion and I was just like well that explains Gilmore's two dynamic events right about there uh, and then the second video that he did was sort of a response to the criticisms that he got in the first one and it was fantastic because he basically says I had uh, a lot of people say you know well yeah but the, the dynamic events didn't really have any consequences it didn't change the world he pointed out that like many people notice, the higher levels you get, the, the more the consequences are. And <clears throat> he tried to show, you know, basically a level two, he just sat there against an ice elemental, like spamming buttons and won. And then he's like, but here's what happens when I do it at level 17. And he gets owned by the ice elementals. And then he's like, here's what happens if I do it at level 17 and I play smart. And then he's using his stuns and, st- and snares to get away and using his dodge properly. It's a really good sort of retort to the people that said that. Uh, and it also talks about the consequences. Anyway, uh, just going on too much, but I can't recommend those enough. Uh, very cool image here. And this one is basically comparing Guild Wars 1 to Guild Wars 2. And I'll pull that up for you right now. You can see the GIF there. It's sort of a map of the Guild Wars 1 in-game map versus the Guild Wars 2 in-game map. And you can see a lot of the major things there probably caused by dragons for the most part. <laughs> Epid dragons. <laughs> the differences are really dragon marks. <laughs> Blame it on the dragons. I mean, obviously down here you've got Krakatorix, uh, the, the 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 dragon brand. Up here, Jormag created that giant uh, lake when he busted through a glacier or something to that effect, or you know, coming back up out of the ground, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a pretty cool thing, I thought. Let's uh, jump on to the first forum comment that I found. Now, this guys was one of the funniest threads I read in the entire sets of the forums here. Now this is same sex sex marriage supported in Guild Wars 2 and I'm I don't want to discuss the politics of anything. It has nothing to do with what th- what I'm trying to point out here is that this post was so absurd because the guy was like is same sex marriage allowed in RP environments or something like that and then there was like five pages and I didn't even want to read all of them. But 
the response, what somebody said, just to prove the absurdity of this question, was a follow-up question, equally relevant to this game. Does Guild Wars 2 support a pale tree's right to choose? Will it also support our Second Amendment rights as engineers and warriors? Will it support <laughs> prayers to Duena in schools and a universal healthcare system and a game without dedicated healers? <laughs> so... Props to Fancy soul. Red <laughs> for pointing out the ridiculousness <laughs> of this whole thing. Now, the fo the next, very next post was fantastic because they said, not even going to touch the first one, but clearly the Second Amendment isn't upheld because my elementalist can't use a gun. Prayer <laughs> will be supported in all schools except for char schools, and clearly there is universal health care since anyone can res. I can't argue <laughs> with that. <laughs> Oh, uh, man. So that's that's the first of our, our fun comments of the day here. And I don't want to go through all of them uh, in, a, in a really in-depth amount, but here is something I found on Reddit that is very intriguing. Now, this is a person that claims to have figured out the damage formula. Do you guys know for a fact what the damage formula is? Because I hadn't... I had speculation everywhere, but this is one that he says is what he... This is confirmed by a dev. I don't know if it's true or not. He says... Yeah. Skill modifier, like the base damage of the skill, times power, times weapon damage, which is the, the numbers on the weapon itself, divided by armor. I really need to get in and test this, because that sounds like a very easy and simple system to understand. But I don't know how, re how, how accurate it is. I wish I had uh, I wish The fact I had that access. he doesn't attach any like testing or anything it has me a little wary about it, but it, it seems like it would be somewhat accurate. If that is the formula, I mean that that you know how I got into the whole you know I like seeing the min the min you know min max numbers and all mm -hmm. of my stuff. That right there will allow guys like myself to do that. If right. We, if that's the exact formula, so that's awesome if he is right. Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, I I I asked him if he had a source, and he said I a dev I met over the weekend in the PvP lobby. So he might just be trolling people. But, you know, he, he seems honest enough. It doesn't seem like a troll. So what we'll do is we'll keep this in the maybe department until we can test it in the next beta. But I just wanted everybody to know, uh, you know, to test it next time. And uh, we'll see if it's actually accurate. All right. So, melee versus range. An official response, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, can't find the topic with that permalink. I guess that's a fail on my part. Darn it! Okay, we're going to delete that one. I could have sworn... That we had, uh, well, okay. So, let's move on. There was uh, a response about character wipe. They basically said, we don't know yet. Um, and this is a very interesting post. Boobs on a cat girl is what I titled it. <laughs> basically, the first post says, how come the female char don't have boobs? As a female, I want boobs. And there was tons, of, tons and tons of responses, but there was... And, and what, what's more is, do you believe how much ArenaNet is responding to these? I was... Yeah, I was even this thread here, they, I believe they responded once or twice. It was hilarious. Yes. <laughs> Kristen Perry, I think, is one of the main concept artists, if I'm not mistaken. Look at that response. Yeah. She goes into this <laughs> yeah, whole that's thing. Not, that's like a detailed response. I can't believe it. So... Why would you have a mammal with no mammary protrusions? Yes, it was discussed internally if we needed to make a cat girl. We know there's a market for it, and to some extent, it's what folks may expect, but it never sat quite right. We wanted to make the char females feel as just as competent and fierce as their male counterparts. And she goes on, but <clears throat> that, I think, speaks to the integrity of ArenaNet. You know, they recognized that they were going to have a lot of people that would be interested in that kind of a they decided, you know what, that's not part of our vision. Our vision is to have the, the female char be, you know, fierce and, and competent and very, uh, ha have them be feminine in a different way. They still need to be fierce and, and warlike just as much as the men, because that is a huge part of their lore. If you go back and read, there was a point in time in which the female char were second-class citizens, and there was sort of an uprising where they're like, well, we can freaking fight too, and they basically showed them who was boss. So... Anyway, very interesting post. Again, I'm going to try to run through these as fast as I can. Very quickly, a sell all junk button is coming. Hallelujah. Am I right? Yeah, that is pretty awesome. I'm glad to see that. 
they basically said they had it in the game, but it had not yet, uh, I guess, been implemented by the time the beta had come out. Now, John Peters finally answered a question that we've all been asking for a long time. He said, AoE attacks hit up to five targets. AoE buffs or heals can heal up to five. We cap it at five because it's the party size and it lets us rein in the balance on AoE without impacting most normal situations. World versus World is the one place where this shows up, but we believe the alternative is worse. Hope this helps, unquote. So. Uh, now the alternative they speak of uh, could mean one of two things. Now, you know, and you know how wild is it, right, Bridger? They I mean, essentially, yeah. if you do an AOE to a group of 30 people, um, they will split the damage. Like basically there's a hard cap on damage it could do um, and it will split it among. So if uh, like as a rogue, if I did fan of knives and I would normally hit just the average person for 4K, if there was 20 people around me, I would only do like 300 damage to everybody. So what would happen then is that a priest would run along and say healing rain or, you know, whatever and heal everybody instantly because you only did 300 damage. Uh, another counter to that if um, would be just allow max damage for AOEs. And if that were the case, imagine what elementalists could do by themselves <laughs> to to a Zerg. I mean that media shower. I, yeah, I think five I think five is a little low, uh, but it's definitely if you compare it to to WoW or the alter or the other alternative, that being just allowing full damage, uh, it's I like it. I really do. Uh, a lot of people are raging about it on the forums and such, but I, I think it's needed. Raging, raging that it's not higher than five, or raging that it's just an epic nerf to AOE. Like just oh, period, okay. it, it removes the whole idea of casting an AOE. That if you cast it on twenty people, you should be able to hit twenty people. You know, and if you line that up, whereas the way World v World and such, because this is mainly targeted to World v World, obviously, mm -hmm. yeah. um, yep. and the way the way World v World works, you know. It, they, they. I, I guess I can relate to them. They feel like that if they line up that perfect shot, that that volley with the ranger, for example, uh, that they should be able to hit all ten guys, you know. And but in this case, they could pretty much cast it anywhere because with all these zerg guilds running around, you're bound to hit five anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think they should increase it because I think everyone should know that it's world v world and it's not gonna be balanced, you know. And that I feel that, that that cap is to try and I guess bring some balance to everything. But um, yeah, I just agree increasing it just because it, I guess it'd make things more well, interesting. Warhammer Although my, Online... my, computer, my computer would probably explode from seeing all those numbers just pop up all at once. <laughs> <laughs> it was so satisfying and wow, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Even yeah. though they, you weren't actually doing any more damage <laughs> than, than if you'd hit five people, when you hit 20 people, you see tons of numbers pop up and you're like, yeah! But. Warhammer Online, I think, when it first came out, did not have any kind of cap on no, AOEs. No, they didn't. It's and why that... I rolled a Bright Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I so rolled a Bright oh, Wizard. Oh, Freelancer, your, your, your phone. phone. <laughs> and if, for those of you wondering why that's happening, Freelancer is actually using the, the microphone on your webcam, right? Because the headset broke? Uh, yeah, well, the headset's breaking, but yeah. I've had this this dandy little headset I'm wearing, Sennheiser, which I still recommend for uh, six years now, and it finally is going to put on me. I'm very sad. So, so I guess what whatever uh, recording uh, instrument is in the webcam, it's not nearly hardened as, as much against cellular radiation <laughs> is, the, is the answer to that question. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. I'll do an episode uh, uh, strictly dedicated to hardware. I think that would be fun to do. Absolutely. When we run, when you know, when we're in the doldrums between beta weekends. Absolutely. All yeah. right. So this is something we reported earlier, but a lot of people may have missed it. There, we talked about how you can put your own music into Guild Wars 2 to play in the background. Well, Jim Bower answered somebody's question on the uh, forum here, and he basically said, "Well, it was actually working in the beta weekend event. It just wasn't documented. There's a folder in your My Documents Guild Wars." Uh, two basically that creates a music folder next to the screenshots folder and basically you just drop a playlist in there and it'll just play it it's that easy there's nothing in game there's no in game interface and he said there probably won't be because they their interface people have a lot of other work to do and this works perfectly fine so the only real disadvantage here is that it does not support any uh, 
what do you call it, iTunes playlist. So anybody who uses iTunes exclusively might have a problem here, but they support all the main playlist formats, WPL, M3U, PLS, ASX, and WAX. And audio types are pretty much everything, MP3, AUG, FLAC, Wave, uh, and even some old school formats like .mid. If you want some midis playing in the background when you're playing Guild Wars 2, there you go. And what's even better is you can sort it into multiple different types of playlists. The, the ones that you can sort are ambient, battle, underwater, city, crafting. You want some special crafting music to make you feel like a boss? <laughs> a, We're not gonna take it. Yeah! Put that hammer in that. I don't know boss battle, nighttime, and main menu. So you can actually test this out yourself because you can still launch the, the launcher, right? And you can get into the main menu. So you can add a main menu.m3u, for example, and boot up the game. And if you hear your own music in the background, you know it's working. So that's a really cool feature. Hmm. Would, you, would you guys use that at launch when that comes into play? I would horrible. change the boss battle music. I just see horrible, really horrible images of YouTube videos of kids loading up their game to disturbed music. I, I just can't <laughs> oh, get it out of my head right now. I just, I see it happening. No, I think it's awesome. Definitely plus one for Arena out there. Ah, oh, man, is another one of these. They must be deleting threads or maybe it's something they change in the forum, messing stuff around. But there was a thread that specifically was trying to clear up the confusion over how ArenaNet uses terminology. And for example, the term that they use to represent the realm or the game world that you are on is shard. So, and that's, that's sort of a common term, for example. Let's say, so, so um, uh, Dreaming Rock is one shard. Crystal Desert is one shard. However, when they say server, what they really mean is the location of the data center usually. And so there are, there is basically US servers and EU servers. And there are also separate from that, what is in the chat room that I'm missing? <laughs> okay, so uh, our buddies, uh, <laughs> our buddy Zira says, imagine uh, down with the sickness playing every time you crash something. <laughs> I just couldn't get that out of my head. Uh. Okay. I'm not a music person now. I'm confused. I'm just going to move on. Just be, be grateful, Bridger. Be very grateful. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, some awesome news from Mike Ferguson. He just wanted to drop in and let everybody know that in the next beta, Siege Weapons, uh, are basically, are, you're going to have the ability to kick out someone who used a Siege Weapon that you placed on the ground. So, no more Siege Ninja-ing. If you bring your siege weapon and somebody else gets in it, you can you can kick them right back out and take it over. So that seems like it would be quite useful in prevention against trolls. Definitely. Indeed. Yeah, so that's... I, I definitely agree with that. That's I could actually already see some implementations with that. And then he, he ends that by saying, you guys wanted the arrow cards buffed, right? That's what we're working on next. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Damn it. Error card I, don't buffs. Error, I don't think arrow cards needed a nerf, but that's just me. They were, they were fine. Just people... What you got here, Bridger, is is Zergs running around. They get hit by an error card, and they don't know how to react to it. And so they cry, oh, error card's OP. And because any, nobody could afford anything better than error cards, that's all you saw. And it's I, I just think what we're going to see here, and, and mark my words on whatever it is, uh, May 6th, that they're going to nerf them now. And then later on, when everybody can afford better, they're going to buff them again because people are complaining that they don't do enough damage to solo targets just yeah but it, ex exactly so well the way it was explained when i read that thread it was like they had already nerfed the arrow carts before the beta weekend or like there's something that has been changing back and forth for them like internally and that they were in, they had brought it up to three seconds i think but they yeah, just so hadn't put it in yet so right now like arrow carts have three abilities the main ability is the damage dealer it does 400 ticks times like three or four times if the average person with half a bit of common sense just dodges out of it it wasn't hard to avoid if you have mass amounts of them it wasn't hard to avoid those as well i mean that's well there was the bug friend. where you couldn't tell which were friendly and which were enemy siege yeah, circles. Oh, as far as uh on the circles on the ground yeah, yeah so sure. so that when they put that back in it will basically be a nerf to all siege weaponry that targets players because it'll be much easier to see when they're coming <clears throat> it's just by themselves uh you know arrow carts didn't do a ton of damage a full salvo of arrows hitting you from an arrow cart did maybe 1800 damage if that and that's assuming you didn't you know do any heals or anything 
you had how much HP bridge or what about a little over 13, 15 K. Yeah. Um, you know, so Eric Hart's by themselves didn't do a ton of damage. Um, the, the big benefit of Eric Hart's was the number three skill, the, the snare. Now that was a mm -hmm. little, a little overpowered. I mean, I'm not quite sure how arrows raining from the sky somehow snare your feet to the ground, but, um, yeah, it, it's still a wizard the did it. snares <laughs> that go through your foot. Good. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Very, very, very well aimed arrows. <laughs> That's the answer. Uh, yeah. The oh, my thought, and actually, if arrow cards do need a nerf, my thought is that the best way to do it would be set it so that they have a specific arc of fire, say like a hundred and fifty, hundred and sixty degree arc of fire, and they can't shoot anything outside of that arc. And then if you want to turn the arc, you've got like three and uh, you've got four and five skill slots still open on the arrow cart. Make that the ability to turn and make it turn, you know, not entirely, maybe not quite as slow as a trebuchet, but, you know, somewhere in that sort of range so that if you want to like instantly turn around and kill somebody behind you with an arrow cart, you can't do it. That, that I think would be the only way that, uh, that I would see them really needing a nerf. How about uh, doing that to Ballista? I that mean, too. I think that would be good. pretty silly. We had guys in uh, TL that were manning Ballista, and they'd have, like I said this last, I believe, last time, and they would just do, like, instant 360s and one-shot people. I mean, it was insane. It was, there was no turn radius on them. Uh, but, uh, they, yeah, if they had an arc of some sort, that would, like, that would actually probably fix the problem because if you could outmaneuver the arrow carts, uh, basically outplay your opponents or the, the enemy guild, uh, not only would it be neat to do, you know, the, the whole, to actually encourage flanking, uh, and, but uh, when you actually do flank them, it, I mean, it, it, it would actually be pretty powerful because right now you can rain arrows on yourself. No big deal. Do a barrel roll before every shot like Vane, apparently. Um, <laughs> so this is a couple of really quick things I'm going to jump through here. Uh, somebody asked about a Darkness Falls style dungeon. For those of you that played uh, DAOC, there was a dungeon it basically in the the realm the rvr sort of realm versus realm uh world versus world equivalent and it would only be available to people who were to the side that was winning the faction that was winning and then after another faction took over the center suddenly they would have access and everybody inside would just be like this giant sweeping maneuver where the winning team would just sweep through the dungeon and it would have special awesome gear or what have you. So there was actually a response to this from Mike Ferguson. He said, unfortunately, we won't have a DF style map when we ship. However, we have been known to add things to our games before. And there are more than a few Dark Darkness Falls fans working here. So who knows what the future may hold? Fun factoid, that was one of the first things I helped out with when I started out as a designer. So I don't know, did maybe Mark, Mike Ferguson come from the DAOC team? Is that what he's implying? Or is he implying, I was working on that when I joined ArenaNet. When they first put me on the job, they said, make us a Darkness Falls map. And it got cut out of the game. I don't know how to interpret that. Uh, I need to know more about my ArenaNet employees, I guess. I need to read more of those posts. Um, <laughs> So here's something that actually is a very interesting concept. When making your character, they were talking about how there's only one voice for the male and one voice for the female of each race. Ten different voices. And somebody said, is it possible to somehow change the tone or pitch of uh, character voices during character creation I instead of just having one? Uh, and, and Jim Bower responds to somebody who said, it's called pitch shifting with format preservation. And yeah, we're looking into this. So that sounds pretty cool. You might have each character have... A slightly more unique voice. I just see everybody rolling like female Asura and raising it really high pitch. And <laughs> well, <laughs> no, hopefully I they'll have some standards. Norn with a high pitch voice, or like a giant Char with a high pitch. Just voice. make a it'll Michael probably... Jackson Norn. Hey everybody! Yeah, I just want to probably... say they have, <laughs> the bear is the best. They have the voice option in uh, what is it? Gotham City Imposters. You could change the voice in that. And everyone makes it to the most annoying voice you could possibly make. Yeah, that might that's be. All, it. That's the only thing. Now that like, I'm I thinking hope about that you it. can change the voices, but you can't make like a clown voice or something. That's just frustrating. Now you that I'm thinking think about it, would be neat, uh, Bridger. You know how Ray the World be World, there would be like our our allies would have these little uh, chat bubbles appear above their head. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, for whatever reason, if they were reviving somebody, it might say something random. Did you ever notice those? They just appeared sometimes, and I don't yeah. know why or what. Maybe when you're in a when they party? get buffed, they say certain things. Like I know the yeah, the most exactly. popular one was Swift. <laughs> I can outrun, I can outrun a, a centaur. centaur. <laughs> yeah. So imagine if you could sort of customize those or unlock more like 
you know, more availability where you can select which ones you want them to show. Sell them in the I, shop. That would be a really neat one. <laughs> Somebody in the chat room <laughs> said we should sell boobs for the for the char in the gem store. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, ooh. There we go. Uh, so th somebody asked if there was the ability to reserve guild names because basically uh, a guild by the name of Almost Famous, somebody got into the game and registered that guild before them just to troll them. It was like a one-person guild clearly done just to, to screw with these guys despite the fact that they're established, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the only response, uh, red response here is, I'm sorry that this happened, but no names are res reserved for the beta weekend events. Check for information about name reservations in the future. So it sounds like they have plans to do some kind of guild name reservation. Uh, so that that is actually very enheartening to me because I don't I didn't know before this point whether they had planned that or not. But it sounds like they are planning it. Yeah, and let's not forget they still haven't done like the big guild reveal yet. You know how they did they they cover all these big sections of the game. Mm -hmm. They've done you know events. They've done the world v world one. But one thing they always keep hinting, if you look at a lot of these threads, is that, you know, we have we have a lot of things in the works for guilds, you know, that the guilds are not finished yet. They're not polished. Mm -hmm. So what I would love to see is not only like when they announce the guilds and they announce all the buffs and upgrades and they have that big blog post, but somewhere maybe towards the end where they say, We're, we'll have this system set up to reserve your name and then uh, have a system set up to where you could like pre-roll on a server. If you remember uh, Star Wars, uh, you know, we all like to bash and love and hate on Star Wars, but they did that. They were, they allowed you as a guild to sign up and basically ensure that you got into a particular server as a guild. And I thought that was a really, really neat system. Um, if they do something similar, even if they just do name reservation, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, it happened to us, TL, as well. Our, our guild name was taken as soon as we rolled in. And, um, you know, no big deal. We just rolled, I think it was TL Net or something. But, yeah, I think um, it was Team Legacy Net. I, I think this is going to happen. You're going to have those trolls that just, they have a list of guild names, and they as soon as they get in, they're creating the game, the guilds themselves. Now, another way they can prevent this, obviously, is to add a cost to creating a guild, um, which I believe we discussed before, which mm -hmm. that could go either way. Um, that would prevent it as well, though. You know, obviously, a organized guild that has that income flow from all the different members immediately could throw up their guild versus that single troll that doesn't have that money to do that right mm. away. Certainly. Could be possible. I think the res the reservation concept is a little bit more nuanced and, and would be more effective. But you're right. Quick and dirty, that is one, you know, there's like, okay, three gold to register a guild. So you have to actually have, you know, a really dedicated team of trolls to get that before the guild does. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, community. 4chan, <laughs> unite! No, that's not going to happen. Heard some cats over there. Anyway, uh, another one here. Mike Ferguson said that the squad system, and this is in response to some criticisms of the squad system and somebody suggesting, you know, ways to make it better. Mike Ferguson said, quote, yeah, the squad, the squad system isn't ready for prime time yet. We've got a couple of improvements planned for squads and commanders prior to launch, though, unquote. So that's, that's encouraging. It's good to hear that they're still planning some more things for the squad system. Personally, I'd love to see the ability to have more private squads or, or some kind of system for organizing private groups, but they don't want us to organize private groups, right? They, they yeah. want it to be, you know, get together, make it easier to jump in as opposed to private I feel clicks. like we need hierarchical systems, though, and we don't have anything like that in the game right now. I mean, we, we could make a whole bunch of five-person groups, mm -hmm. and then we've got a whole bunch of five-person groups, but there's no way to organize them and see, like, okay... We're going to, you know, let's take two groups and merge them into, uh, you know, a team or whatever you want to call it, a regiment, a battalion, how, well, company, whatever. And then, uh, you know, you might want, as, as, a, as a raid leader, you might want a, this group of 10 people to always stay together and raid supply lines, right? Well, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be really nice if you could see all of those people as a specific color on the minimap? I mean, you can always already see everyone up to five people so it's really annoying to try and find your group yeah, if there's no tools I, like that or maybe even if they maybe like if the commander could appoint like lieutenants or something mm. and then they get an icon and then you make them part of those little five or ten person groups so that you see that icon running around as opposed to you know different colored dots 
Because, I mean, when you have that giant herd of people, you can't even see the dots half the time anyway. You, <laughs> some, you can't even see the commander icon if, it's, if he's close enough. True, true enough. Um, so let's see. Uh, next up on the list. Oh, this is very good. Um, somebody was complaining about the whole uh, money to gold system. And they basically said, you know what? Anybody who thinks that the money to gold system removes third party companies from selling gold is either ignorant or naive. For example, Eve Online has this kind of system, yet you can't play that game for five minutes without running into a spammer selling ISK for dollars. In fact, it's so common that in that game that they even have an option to report ISK spammer directly by right clicking the character name in chat. And the response from ArenaNet is perfect. Quote Remember, combating third party trading isn't a Boolean equation. Having police doesn't prevent all crime, but that doesn't make police a bad idea, unquote. <laughs> a very good retort, I thought. I don't think anybody ever suggested that it would prevent all, uh, you know, gold sales or character sales or anything like that. But it certainly will combat a large part of it. I would say at least 50% or more. Yeah, there's absolutely. Just, there's just going to be yeah. way less customers for those, you know, out of the way things. Yep. Yeah, the, the key thing to notice, though, is that I think in EVE, you could almost reverse your uh, your economy in-game and get more game time. But essentially, you can um, you can buy uh, real-world items, which is subscriptions, etc., and even more, depending on how you go through. Whereas in, in Guild Wars, it's one way. Or, you know, you can only buy gems. You can't trade gems back for money. You know, right. and there's no there's no subscription fee, so you, you there's no way you can actually sell back um, he's comparing it to E, but that, that huge difference is still there. And, right, because uh, if, be you can, if you can take money sort of metaphorically out of the system and into the real world, which is kind of possible in EVE due to the way that they have the interaction of the, of, of the what do they call those, the Plex system, then there's a huge incentive at that point for ISK farmers to do what they do and form a gray market where they can keep that money instead of CCCP. Whereas in, a, in Guild Wars 2, like you're saying, you can't pull that out. So the incentive is less, is lower anyway. Yeah. All right. The last thing on the list here is a massive post by Jonathan Sharp. He starts with a quote from Albert Einstein, which I think is actually really well applicable, I guess you could say. Quote, any intelligent fool can make things... Oh, sorry. Albert Einstein. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger more complex and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. All right, my, my, my Einstein needs some work. I thought I that agree. was pretty good. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Bravo, sir. Bravo. Uh, so anyway, I think that's actually a perfect example. And, and it shows that ArenaNet knows what they're talking about because it's really, really easy to add things to any kind of design, whether you're talking engineering or game design. It's easy to add things. It's really hard to take things away and keep the essence of what's there. It's, it's so much harder to do that. And, they, and that, that's exactly what that quote is talking about. So they, they respond to a lot of the different feedback that's on here. And they basically said, we, we don't have time to reply to every thread, but we do read them all. And uh, basically they respond to the people that wanted more than conquest. And they said, sorry, this is what we're going with at the beginning. And, you know, time constraints, that's what they have to do also. Suck it, Team Deathmatch. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm not... I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, but I, I also understand why people want, you know, team deathmatch arena style, things like that. But I think asking for it at this point when the game seems to be kind of behind schedule as it is, uh, is it, maybe we'll get it. it it's, is, it's the thing I find funny is that I, I bet you any amount of money that the same people that are crying about, they want team deathmatch or they want something else. As soon as they say, all right, we're going to add these things, but it's going to add X amount of months to the release date. Then they'll start crying about, well, how come the game's not getting released on time? Yeah, exactly. So, so <clears throat> and uh, let's see. They're, they've talked about how basically the PvP, uh, structured PvP lobby system still wasn't really where they wanted it to be. And it's still definitely getting a lot of work. It's
reiterates what they're going to add to the server system. The server browser is going to be better and how you're going to be able to set up groups of people to go into the same PvP server together and, and basically said, you know, this isn't it. It's getting a lot better than this. Uh, the tournaments, etc. Balance is not final. He talked about melee versus ranged and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's definitely worth checking into that. He also talks about what he thinks, uh, you know, is required for an eSport and how he, they're trying to put that into Guild Wars 2. It's a very... Very clearly, they understand what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff, at least from my perspective. Did you get that feeling, Freelancer? Yeah, I did. I was glad to see how a lot of this because, um, you know, we were wondering about tournaments. We were wondering about structured PvP. I know our structured PvP guys, they were just pulling their hair out because the best way they could practice <laughs> together was to try to randomly join the same server and hope and hope that most of them got put on one team, you know, and it was so frustrating for them. And, uh, uh, a big, you know, I heard about it, and then I went in and tried it myself, and I was like, man, this is this is uh, this is kind of depressing. I can't even play with my guild if I want to. And uh, but it's good that they're working on that. We knew they were going to work on it. I wasn't surprised to to hear that, and I'm glad to see that they have it on their uh, agenda. Yeah, it, it, I was slightly concerned because it's so far from what they claimed it was going to be at release. And I was worried and wondering if maybe they're going to back off some of their original promises. But basically, they've reiterated in this post everything that they said that's going to be there. So that just goes to show, listen, we know it's not there. It's coming. Don't worry. We're not, you know, we're not changing the, the goalpost here. So that's definitely good. I'm, I'm really I, happy to hear that's, that. I, that's like, I'll go on Vega. Um, I was just saying, I like how they touched on the fact, because I feel that a lot of people were saying that it's it's not going to be a good eSport because people won't understand it, and how, you know, if, if people were trying to compare it to Guild Wars 1, how if you're trying to spectate Guild Wars 1, and you don't know much about the game, it's kind of hard to pick up everything that's going on. Um, but I think the reason, I like how we touched on the fact, you know, they have the score screen, they have those objectives, and it makes it very clear what the teams are fighting for. And that that's what you need in an eSport. You need something that's easy to pick up and understand. And I know that, um, I know we got a little bit of feedback and I know I heard in other places how, oh, it's not going to work because people won't understand it. And I think that's not true. It's definitely not true to a lesser extent. I mean, for the, the example that people give is, you know, World of Warcraft, people have so many skills that you can't possibly know what's going on at any given moment. You have to memorize every animation for every damn class to know what they're going to use. That kind of, a, that's the kind of the argument. And the counter argument is that in Guild Wars 2, you can easily see what weapon they're wielding. And then you only need to memorize those five, you only really need to have memorized those five things. Because you don't have to worry, okay, was that, you know, binding grasp or grasping binding? I don't know. Well, if you know what weapon they have, chances are they've only got one sort of cripple, and they've only got one sort of speed buff, and they've got one big spiky thing and one AoE on that kind, you know, on a weapon or something to that effect. So you should be able to tell them apart. The fact that the weapons are grouped is going to make esports commentary way easier than if you could mix and match. And I'm very happy about that. Yep. Yep. Also, the one thing I want to say is, like, they, they restated kind of like what they originally said they wanted to do with Structured, but it's nice to see them actually saying something, because I know a lot of other companies that would be like, they'd stay silent through all this, like, sort of feedback and stuff like that, and this is one thing that ArenaNet gets a lot of, like, props for, in my opinion, is that they're very, very vocal in community, like, they communicate with their community, and they, like, say, yeah, it's, it's like, not where we want it to be, but here's what we're still working on, and, like, this is what we're looking to do. And, you know, I've seen videos where they're playing with people all weekend long. You know, they joined us in World of This World and went against us in World of This World. They were there, and their, their interest in their own game kind of, like, gets me excited. 30... A tip of the hat to Arena. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, hang on. One, two, three, four. 36 pages of developer posts yep. after this beta. 36 pages that look like this. I think somebody did the math and it was something ridiculous and that huge props. I was so blown away by the amount of feedback and not just like community manager Bob says or, you know, it, well, community manager Regina tries to reply to all of the ridiculous, you know, complaints from everybody. No, you've got John Peters in there. You've got, I think Colin is even posting somewhere. You've got the writers. You've got the concept artists responding in each in their own sort of categories to boobs on a cat girl or booling police. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing how kind of and free reign they've given themselves. And, and not even just like, oh, we hear you, we'll work on it. Like, they're, they're going into the problems. Walls and, of text. Yeah. Hats it's off to ArenaNet. 
Absolutely. Yes. Red Massive Post. Red Post is going to be the name of this week because, oh man, <laughs> it's way better than Blue Post. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more to read, that's for sure. Absolutely. All right. So, that having been said, uh, it, I love to praise ArenaNet because they have basically done so much that's like innovative. Innovative. I never know how to say that. Uh, and, and to me, that just makes it all the more frustrating when they sort of drop the ball on something, you know? I mean, I'm playing the game and afterwards it occurs to me. I had to rebind all my keys, and I expected to have to rebind all my keys because I've got four mouse buttons. That's fine, whatever. And I realized, okay, this is ArenaNet using six, seven, eight, nine, and zero on the keyboard. And okay, it's been done before. Every other MMO does that. But that's no excuse. This is Guild Wars 2 we're talking about. This is Arena we're talking about. Just because other MMOs do it doesn't mean it's the right choice. Why the hell do I have my hand on the left side of the keyboard and you expect me without looking down to be able to take that left hand and hit the zero button? What? Are you insane? At the very least, take 67890, or at least 7890, and put it on ZXCV. How hard is that? I don't think those are even being used for anything in the game. Come on, ArenaNet. This is not hard. It's simple physics. Put everything on the left side of the keyboard, and we're done. That's all it takes. And whose idea was it to put F1 through F4 in the game? <laughs> oh, man. That just, uh, that just can't work. How are you going to tell people you have to move and dodge and run around while fighting and then say, yes, but you also need to do finger gymnastics. So if you're moving forward and you need to move left and you need to press the F1 button, you need to reach your thumb around and do that. There you go. Or you need to stop and then move again. So you're going to see everybody and it's like epic fight. He's moving, he's bobbing, he's weaving, he's throwing fireballs and then stands there. And then starts throwing lightning, and then starts throwing lightning and bobbing and weaving, and then stands there. And now he's got earthquakes. It's like, what? What is the idea behind this? That's not cool. I, I just, uh, you know what? Slap on the wrist, ArenaNet. That's, uh, that's not cool. Six through zero at the very least. Come on, remap that by default. Teach everyone else to follow you like you're doing in every other part of the game. That's my rant for the week. That was great. I'm proud Not of bad. you, Bridger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing that I get into when I play RTS games that don't have grid keys. It ah, it makes me so angry. I, when the first people that figured out grid keys, for those of you that don't know, the concept is that in an RTS, in sort of the bottom corner of the screen, you've got this grid of actions that every unit can do. And that grid want, it should be corresponding to the grid of keys on the left-hand side of the keyboard. So QWER are the top four buttons. ASDF are the next four. ZXCV. And you know, of all the damn RTS games that I have seen and played, Command & Conquer gets this right? Are you serious? <laughs> How are they going to get this right? That blows my it's, mind. It's Command & Conquer, man. <sighs> <laughs> can't bash Command & Conquer. I can. Ever since Westwood isn't Westwood anymore, I can. Don't tell me <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, moving on. Let's revisit World vs. World. We got a couple of more minutes here. Let's talk a little bit more about World vs. World. Did you guys... This is something we didn't touch about in the main show last week. Did you guys do any of the NPC faction type uh, dynamic events that take place in World vs. World? Every time, yep. Uh, I specifically remember uh, one of our raid leaders, uh, Soulstitch, yelling, we need to get these ogres, we need to get the ogres, you know, or, or watch out, you know, or it was always, uh, there, there are a lot, you know, I, I blew them off. Uh, I, I was completely incorrect because I thought they weren't going to be a big deal. You know, it's just, oh, yeah, you could just zerg them down, right? No, you, you assault that keep uh, in the central map, their little red tower there, and you have ogres come up behind you, everything, all hell breaks loose. And that's just simply because one of them is a champion, and he one shots everybody he hits. So it's uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty awesome. They ended up being a lot more uh, intuitive with the NPCs, how they can move around and follow you and such than I thought they would be. I was very impressed. Anybody else? Vega? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Do all right, great. Like you that. spent all weekend in there. Come on, tell me. You oh, went I there. happen to run into a few ogres and uh, Hylic, as they're called, the Frogman. I think. 
<laughs> I, I, they're they're interesting because like they can be sort of the people you need in places where you don't have to actually send your own people. Like the ogres can just like walk up to a supply camp and take it for you and do all the work for you. And that's insane. By just like sending a couple people over to kill like harpies and something like that, they can knock down gates. I think too. Am I correct with that one? Yeah. Does anybody? Uh, they, yeah, they will run up to a gate and start attacking it. Usually, they get eventually overrun by guards. But um, the fact that they're there to support you and they can pull all the aggro off of you and um, and do that damage. If even if you just provide one or two people to kind of help them and pull the guards from just uh, continually harassing them, they could take down, eventually, the gate by themselves. I mean, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, and they're, they're tough, too. Like, I remember, I think it was um, me and a couple members, I remember Oku being there specifically, we kind of, like, were, were going to get, like, a Dolyak or something, and then this ogre champion comes, like, running down the hill, like, being kited by other people that were on our server, and he just decimates us. Like, these ogres are not to be, like, uh, trifled with. They are. They will mess you up. So do they have a set path? Like as soon, like the way that, and to explain a little bit, I only participated in one of these because it was only active. Like for a while, it, like I went to the High Lick Camp, which is in the very southern part of the Eternal uh, Battlegrounds. And when I got there, it was already like in our favor. Like we had already captured it earlier. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And I just ran through it on the way to capture a supply camp. The next time I came through, it was being attacked by these Naga snake things, right? And it, it basically, there were three bars, and each server could contribute to helping the Hylic, and the server that filled up their bar and helped the Hylic the most first would then get the friendship of the Hylic, or whatever you call it. So I was there with a couple of friends, and we managed to, you know, basically secure the event for our server. And I was like, oh, that was cool. And then I see this troop of Hylic, like, marching out on their bouncy hind, hind legs. And I was like, let's follow them. And they ran over to a supply station and helped us take it. Uh, but is do they always go to the same, like, two places, the two supply stations adjacent to them? Is that always their goal? Do we know? Uh, they sort of follow uh... Uh, path. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the waypoints on the path are, but I noticed they always eventually took the supply camp if you help them out and nobody harassed them. So I, I think they pretty much go to the supply camps there. For us, they were like, because we had our group of, uh, of TL and they were for us, we would quickly run by the harpy area, slaughter all the harpies, and then we didn't have to worry about taking the supply camp to the um, the east of the Red Tower, uh, Red, Garrison, or Red Garrison area up there north of it. And because the, the ogres would go take it for us. And um, I didn't notice a, them attacking anything else beyond that. So I think it's just pretty much they will sort of head in a particular direction. And once they take it, they take it and they despawn maybe. Um, I think they stick around and protect it for a while. Out. But yeah, then, but then I think I don't even know how long it is. But it, maybe it's twenty minutes, maybe it's an hour on how long they stay attached to your side before they get attacked by the naga again. And then maybe I mean this is arena net. Maybe they like like all of a sudden somebody runs up from their camp and says the naga are attacking our homeland, and they all run away like they're just on guard duty. Like let's defend the blue. They're our friends. Oh crap! The naga are attacking. Mom, are you okay? Like, <laughs> that would just be awesome. Uh, but it, it, it's very interesting. Now, how can they... Somebody confirmed in the chat that they can attack doors. But if they only go... Hang on. Solstice says you can double team two races to send Mega Ultra Army to a keep door. So he says that there is a way to have the... Uh, oh, it's Crate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Solstice. Please don't ban me. Um, <laughs> crate are attacking the Hylic. <laughs> And, uh, but, okay, we gotta wait for Solstice to answer this. He says they're attacking keep doors, but if they only go after the, the supply camps, maybe after they capture the supply camp, if there's enough left, they go after a keep? Is that how it works? Somebody, somebody in the chat room needs to confirm that for me. But I thought it was a really cool event. It was kind of a fun thing that you can do, again, with five or six people. I would love to see, like, a big fight happen over one of those. Did that ever happen with you guys? Like, we were fighting other players while you were trying to help it out? We were assaulting that tower I mentioned, and I remember it was on the first day, we had all were like, we're like level two and three, and we were assaulting the tower north of uh, Stone Mist. And uh, we had, I think, 15, maybe 20 guys there. Not a big deal, we had one ram, we just barely mustered up enough money to get that ram. And, um, and all of a sudden these ogres hit us from behind and, and I didn't think anything of it. I blew it off. I, and that was the biggest mistake I made in the first three hours of the game. <laughs> and, uh, next thing, you know, and they're, they're kind of kiting them around. You know, I'm kind of proud of the TL guys. They're not getting hit. They're dodging and stuff. 
Well, next thing you know, this champion comes out of nowhere and just starts one shotting all my guys. <laughs> and I'm like, everybody off the door. <laughs> and, and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? We need to hit these ogres now. They're <laughs> wiping our bad guys out. They destroyed our, our – uh, we had set up a catapult at that point, and um, they destroyed the catapult in like four or five hits, man. It was insane. And we had to do this epic little mini boss battle to get this champion down. And he was just simply, I guess, on his way to the supply camp. And he just happened to intersect where we had our uh, our siege equipment there. It yeah, they probably really, go down really the cool. roads, I would guess. Yeah. Because there's that ramp there that goes down towards where you can either start heading towards the supply or you can head towards the tower. And uh, it, he just, we happened to be in that spot down the ramp coming from the, the highlands there. And he just started mauling us. And it wasn't until I lost half the raid that I was like, these guys are serious. You know, we need to pull off this door and deal with them. Uh, and I was glad to see that. So Solstitch says that one group leaves the, the NPC compound and goes to the supply camp, to a supply camp, probably a and the other one goes to probably one of the close towers. He said keep, but I don't know if he meant towers, because towers are usually closer to those. But maybe if you already own the tower, it'll go to the keep. Maybe it's just a, what you own around there determines you know, the priority. If you don't have this supply camp, then this then group A is going to go after that supply camp. Okay, he meant keep, So, uh, but I know that you have to go through a tower, for example, in one of those situations before you can get to a keep. So maybe they'll take the tower. It goes to the keep no matter what. Okay, just goes bypass the tower. So that must have been what happened to you, Free. They, you guys were attacking a tower, and they're like, dur, 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 let's go to the keep. Hey, there's Freelancer's <laughs> group. Club smash. Pretty yeah, much. Was, All right. It was so club smash, no big deal until the big guy came. <laughs> All the others, I mean, they, they do minimal damage. That big guy is insanely strong. We, it was exciting. It's like a mini boss. So... This question goes out to you guys that played a lot more World vs. World than me, and to Soulstitch as well in the chat. Were there any, let's say in Eternal Battlegrounds, because that's the only one that's not the same for everybody, was one side, blue, green, or red, seem to have better defensive positioning or offensive positioning in that map? Did you get a feeling for that during the beta? Absolutely. Uh, the Whoever spawns at the top, I believe it's the red, red. shard. yep. Um, has an incredible, incredible defensive advantage. Um, it's you, There's multiple points that, because number one, their keep is on high ground. So that's that's obviously the biggest one. You have to go uphill in every direction in order to get to that keep. Um, the walls, the, the outer walls that extend, um, I guess they call it the outer cloister, that go out and you can get on top of them. They go all the way towards Stone Mist. Like they stretch all the way down. You can set up trebuchets there and hit Oh, I Stone see what Mist. you're talking about there. Yeah, it, that yeah, outer. If you look at the map there, the outer cloister, the wall that comes, uh, you know, the, you got two walls that head south, way past where the keep is. Yeah, you're looking at it there. Um, you know, that right there is such a huge defensive position because you could sit on top of those walls. You can get on top of them for relatively easy. You can shell Stone Mist from there, basically. You it's like can. a stone and throw away. That, everywhere <laughs> in that keep, because it's on high ground, can hit the towers around it. I mean, every tower there, except for, I think, the one in the bottom left, um, you know, a little north of Stone Mist on the left there, is is reachable within trebuchet fire from that keep. They have such an advantage there. Um, now, how do you beat that? Does that make the other sides more or less, you know, you know underpowered or overpowered? Uh, I, it's we're going to need to be in the game more often, but I can say as far as the the raids we were leading and in my experience, the world be world that whoever had the top there, uh, it was insanely hard to go anywhere up north without getting shelled by either catapults or trebuchets from somewhere, uh, let alone mortars from that keep itself. Uh, very very strong position. The the bottom left there, green. Um, the big advantage with the green area is it was great for zergs. Okay, it was a wide open vast area that. Uh, if you could coordinate with your guild on a consistent basis where you could say, look, guys, back off. Look, guys, let's go in the water. And, and they listen to you uh, on an efficient basis. You could actually, like, ninja your way to each and every point without being detected because of all the water. Yeah, you can um, go underwater and nobody sees you. Exactly. Now, another big thing with the water is um, the water, if you uh, have – it depends on the, the class you are. There's a movement speed buff with the trident, like in the, for the Mesmer, I believe. Um, that if you can equip all your guild members with uh, the particular weapon that gives you the movement speed buff, you could dive in the water, use the movement speed buff, pop out, use another movement speed buff, and get across the whole entire green area in seconds flat. Um, because the movement speed buff that you use underwater is insane. It's, it's incredibly awesome. Nothing matches it. 
Hmm. And uh, it's like a giant dash to the water. Every class has a version of it. And then uh, you got blue, which blue was just kind of the mediocre area. But the cool thing about blue, Bridger, if you remember, is the underwater pass or the underground passage. Yeah, I think it starts yep. over here somewhere near this water area. Yeah, is there's right? just a there's like a, a well just kind of sitting there. You wouldn't think anything of it, and uh, and most players had no idea. Um, but if you jump in this well, <laughs> which you never expect to be able to, <laughs> it actually opens up to this entire underwater passage leading to this secret door underneath the keep it was the coolest thing ever and i i was just like when i saw it uh when we first discovered it i forget who let me know about it but we jumped in and i'm like what the heck are you guys doing jumping down there and we found this door and the, the door is in this cave so there's almost no way for them to defend from the top of the uh the, you know there's not much room at all you can't really set up siege weapons and defend so it is by far uh the greatest weakness of that keep as well so if i had to lay any uh balance issues here blue definitely by far has the the least event have some kind of a secret door somewhere basically is that blue like is there only two doors in blue there's a front door and that secret door there's no back door maybe no i think there is a back door there is a back door i believe yes um i know like the green keep has a back door but the green keep is so uh how do i wear that it, it's so structured um, it's it's got a level playing field that you can get from one side and defend one door from the other side very very quickly. The another big disadvantage with the green keep that we realize on a consistent basis is that when you set up uh, siege golems, okay, normally uh, I don't think many guilds were able. We, we set up all tons of siege golems, but the only time the siege golems were truly effective is when you get to those double keep doors. And big big disadvantage with the green keep is that on the back end of that you have two doors sitting right next to each other. So if you set up a siege golem or two siege golems, we did a few times, you could take down that one door, move not even three feet in front of you, and take down the second door in less than 30 seconds. It was insanely fast. And that was the only place in the entire world be world that we use siege golems pretty consistently because they're so effective there. No other it's because siege that. golems are usually really slow to move forward? Yeah, if, uh, up until the point we got our mesmer portals, we were able to port siege golems from one place to another. But... Until we got to that point, every time we came to a keep to take down a door with Siege Golem, okay, 100 supply, right? Mm -hmm. it, it would just seem far more feasible for us to set up two rams because they actually take down doors quite a bit faster than a Siege Golem. And it'll also take the Siege Golem forever to get from the outer door to the inner door. But with that green keep, that was not the case. And uh, it was a major, major disadvantage with the green keep. Now, the obvious advantage of the green keep is that it is the closest to its borderland uh, portal than i believe any other keep that the run is less than i think we clocked about 11 seconds wow and, yeah look at that and so you could respawn and, and basically mass zerg down the keep no matter what from the green shard whereas the from the red shard that keep is the red shard overlook keep is overlooking the respawn point so it's not as easy to rush in and take it. Yeah, if your force. enemies take that from you, they have a really good defensive position, just like you did before they took it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's sort that, of a double-edged sword there. That red air area altogether is just so advantageous. If any server gets that position, there is no excuse for losing it. And I, I, I'm saying it like that because it is so easy to defend from that central keep. You can bombard the heck out of every tower around it. And it looks like, and this is adding something I, I really thought of before I played the game, but it looks a lot like the towers are really there to prevent enemies from getting past them behind the keep in the back area, for all intents and purposes. Uh, I mean, for example, this tower here kind of protects the spelled in clear cut, because you can't really get there without going right past this tower. Now, you could go right past the keep instead, but in either case, if there's sentries, you know, if there's players on those keep walls watching, keeping watch, and there will be in, in actual world versus world, you're going to have people whose job it is to watch and make sure nobody's sneaking around to, to, to steal well, the supply from your back wall. At least TL did. <laughs> well, at least TL will. So... Uh, that, that kind of a thing, I mean, you can still see that there's like a little way up here, you can get in the water over here, so it looks like that water in the, green, in, the, in the red shard area could provide a little bit of respite for some sneaky players at one point. But uh, there was, I mean, there's one uh, tunnel, tunnel tower that we kept knocking our heads against the wall, and it's this one right down here, and I actually took some video of it that I'm going to put up on, uh, on YouTube in a bit after I get the other videos out. Jerifer's Sloth. 
and I was with a group of maybe 10 people or so, and we had done the Hylic thing, we got them to chase, a, you know, to chase us over here, and we took the, the clearing, and we had taken this tower, uh, and there was a group of us trying to take the keep here, the main green keep, but they didn't have enough people, and they kept getting pushed back across the bridge, so I think we're going to try and take this tower. This tower is really, really, really hard to take from this this supply camp here. And, and let me try to give you, paint a picture. This right here is a rock outcropping that is only accessible if you're in the tower and you go across the wall here. This road goes underneath a little, uh, a, a little bridge, basically, of the tower. So the door right here, if you're trying to hammer on that door, you're getting hit from literally three sides. Behind you, to your left, and in front of you. And there's no way to set up siege weapons to counteract that without being in range of all three of those walls because of the water right here. And what's more is I came back to it thinking, oh, I'll just knock this wall down over here because there's a lot of open space and Galanta clearing near the supply depot and then I'll also have protection from the guards. Nope, can't do this because it's the only way to get up to the Keep Lord. So attacking from Blue's direction onto this tower is really, really hard. And we, we knocked our head against the wall a couple of times, but we couldn't find a real easy way to do that. Yeah, set a little extension there. You, the, the big advantage is with air carts. You know, you can set up air carts all along that. And what can they do to counter it? Nothing. Because mm -hmm. that wall, you remember how tall that particular wall was? Yeah. It, it was insanely tall. A lot taller than actually most. There were some keeps that didn't even have a, tower, a wall that tall. Um, and it had the arch underneath it. You had to run through it in order to get to the door. Right. And that wasn't um, even protection because they could still hit you under, when you're underneath the arch. It wasn't deep enough as a tunnel to hide your people. Yeah. That was what we called one of the sacrificial points that uh, we didn't bother to even attack. It, it could be completely undefended. And we still didn't head to it. It was a waste of time. <laughs> it yeah. was so defensive. I kind of feel like they need that wall on the that's facing the Galanta supply point to be destroyable somehow. To like add a stairwell that goes up to the Keep Lord somewhere else and let that wall be destroyable because it was really hard to take from that direction. Uh, and I don't know if any other towers were that hard. Did you guys find any other you know non keeps that were in really difficult situations? There was one tower <clears throat> in the Borderland worlds that I remembered that. Whoops. It was like built on the side of like a weird mountain. So like once you get through that front door, you still have to go up like two more levels. It's really, really weird because like you got to cross this like bridge. And then as you're crossing this bridge, if there's still defenders up near the Keep Lord, they can shoot down on you really, really well. And it's a really tight choke point they can get around through. And there was uh, one group that we were into that kind of took advantage of that. Finally, some group got really organized and figured out how to use the choke point. And, uh, Which one are you talking stuff. about now? I don't remember, but it's like one of the top right ones in the Borderlands. The cliff side here? I don't is have a map open. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I've got the map open and I'm not even showing it to you. Here it is. Is this it here? The cliff side one? Uh, yeah, that one. Because see how it's like on that like little like cliff formation right there? Mm-hmm. It, like as you walk through that front door, you have to go up that that uh <clears throat> up to up that keep. Oh, stairwell. you know what? Yes, and this then you is, have to go across. This is the one the Yogg's cast guys did. Uh, uh yeah. their 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 thing of defending. Yeah, you have to go up this and then like across to this and then back across up here. It was a it's a really cool design, but you're right, that's a big pain. And they can hit you from here too. Uh, yep. Although I remember seeing some people set up siege weapons over here in order to fire down onto cliffside. That was interesting. You know what the worst, worst part of that keep is? Or What's uh, tower? What's that? Is leaving it to go south. <laughs> <laughs> the cliff boss claims more people. <laughs> we lost more people after claiming the tower than before. <laughs> uh, this, that cliff boss, man. All right. So actually, where was I here? I had the other... There it is. So... The let's point out for people who maybe didn't get a chance to play a lot of World versus World. Down at the bottom here of Dracate Inlet, we had the Hylic. That's where you fought the Hylic. Over on the top right, we had the Ogre Lands. You helped them fight the Harpies. And then over, I think there's a Dredge down in here. Dredge. Are attacking? Are they attacking or are we helping Dredge? I don't remember. You help the Dredge because then they give you turrets and stuff. Is that where those turrets came from? Do they, yeah. Do they, they like attack people that are coming up? Yep. So they don't actually leave their mole things. They just put, give you defensive turrets all over the place? Yeah, something like that. I kept seeing dredge turrets. These little spinny, spirally things would, like, bury themselves in the ground and then come up whenever somebody comes by. It was really cool. Yeah. All right. That and, extra defense. Now, I didn't 
do too much here, but I understand in the middle lake area, there's uh, somebody that you help there. I believe there's uh, like some sort of event that gives you, like when you claim it, you get control of the weather. I think it is, and then like you can that. call down a thunder. Like when people are attacking your keeps and stuff, there's a thunderstorm that starts hitting random people, and then there's rain that will heal your allies. Something. Oh. Yeah, it's. I think it's Solstice was playing around with that as too. Now, what is this? Black Wicker territory in the top right of. Did anybody go explore this? I didn't do it. But now I want to. What the hell's going on up there? That might be another NPC thing. I know that in the top left, there's like a jumping puzzle hidden up in there. Yeah. That I didn't get to play. But... I, I heard about that like near the end of Sunday. And I'm like, wait, there's a skill jumping puzzle out there? And we were so busy with Dreaming Bay, but I, I had all intention to to go just because I wanted to try a jumping puzzle. I had never done one. Yeah. And uh, didn't get time to do it, but I heard a lot of people had fun doing it. It was just like one of those crazy things that rewards you for exploring. And I thought that was really neat. The one video I saw for it was just insane. It's like it, there's all the these floating islands video? all over the place. The World v. World one. You gotta, yeah, like, it was jump so through weird. A it was literally a platformer. It was like hovering islands and stuff. It's like, a wizard did it, apparently. Um, <laughs> it was really cool design. And it was like, you had no idea where to go. It was like trial and error. You, you don't yeah. know, okay, is this the way to go? Is that the way to go? We'll have to figure it out. It's, it, it looked really difficult. And it's a long way down if you fall. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. we, we all know falling very well. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> One so more thing. Deaths. One more thing I want to cover before we close out for the evening and then go play some League and with a little bit of casting, probably by Eyedrops and I. If Eyedrops here in the chat room, let me know. Uh, I think we're going with you again. Uh, so, the loot system in World vs. World. Obviously, you get money when you capture keeps and things like that. Oku, actually, sorry, not Oku. Um, Kem something. Damn it, why am I blank blanking on his name? The guy who put that those massive posts everywhere about Guild Wars 2 a couple of months ago. He kept them updated, like the ones that are literally pages and pages and pages long. You know what I'm talking about? I don't remember that, no. Okay, nope. well, I'll link you to it. You'll know it when you see it. Anyway, um, he was asking one of the devs about uh, the fact that like they defended uh, these uh, keeps in World vs. World basically forever. Like, for all day. Like, eight hours or what have you. And Omlek, sorry, Omlek, that's his name. Uh, and he said, hey, how come when I defend this keep forever, we can't even get enough money to repair our armor? But when I take a keep, we have enough to buy, like, four siege weapons. You know, so basically the dev said, yeah, we're going to be tuning that because defenders definitely don't get enough rewards for PvP. So that's good. But what I wanted to talk about was the loot system. Uh, and specifically, basically when you participate in killing an enemy, if you did enough damage to them you will have a bag that appears in the ground that you can run around and pick up. But it's not super obvious. Did you guys get annoyed? Like, you kept thinking that maybe you missed them? Yeah, that and, that and uh, gathering in general. I don't think I, I gathered got, a single thing. I know you can gather in World vs. World. I found one yeah. or two nodes. I got I got more frustrated that the keep lords would disappear in, like, two seconds. Yeah. Because they... Did they drop good loot? Yes. Really they good. dropped, yeah. like blue stuff oh man they, they drop pretty decent stuff um it like <laughs> actually at the end of dreaming bay uh you know we put that video up uh, i think you put it up Ridger. it was yes. awesome by the way the way you narrated it uh but at the end of dreaming bay my loot was a like a gray thing and like four silver <laughs> <laughs> like you had enough fun <laughs> yeah it was like you know it I almost think, uh, I don't know, I'm sure they couldn't implement this, but I almost think if you spend four hours, you know, they should almost encourage the long-term sieges because I don't think there was a guild member that walked away from that that wasn't just like, I love Guild Wars 2. If I had any doubts before, now I love Guild Wars 2. And uh, I just think that it, there should be a way that maybe the system can detect if you've been doing this epic long siege, you know, and maybe give you a percentage better loot at the end of it, for example. I don't know. I can I can only hope, right? Yeah, yeah it, it, so what do you guys think about the fact that if you die and you lose the battle, you don't get your loot? Well, that there, I mean, are you talking about the Keep Lords disappearing? About not necessarily the Keep Lord, but let's say, you know, you fight an epic battle, you know, outside of a, a keep and the enemy sallies out of the keep to attack you or what have you and you kill like three or four guys, but you are either driven off or wiped out and you need to spawn and come back and by the time you get back, your loot's gone. 
Well, you know, you, you sh- most players are probably going to set auto loot. I don't think there's any reason. I've set auto loot too, but you still have. To, I mean, in the chaos of world versus world battle, can you see the stupid bags on the ground and run over and pick them up? With all the fireworks going off, absolutely not. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I think I maybe entire weekend and I think I did more world v world than most. Um, I picked up maybe six bags on the ground, like entire weekend. Exactly, um, you can't see them. You know, and that was yeah mainly because uh, it was it wasn't until I actually walked over the body and saw it, I was like, oh wait, what is this? You know, and and I picked it up. But exactly after you're... after a big epic battle, you just see the devastation laid out before you and these little <laughs> glittering bags everywhere. You're like, oh, of course. <laughs> Did you feel uh, as though that you got enough loot in comparison to PvE? Like, they always mention that you can level up in World v. World. How did you feel, like, leveling up uh, yourself, Bridger, in World v. World and getting loot and uh, gathering, you know, and all that uh, equated to PvE? Do you think it was equivalent if you did enough of it? Or do you think, it, you know, you just have to go out to PvE in order to get all the good stuff? Well, when you're doing player versus door... It didn't feel like there was enough loot to go around. Like, if there wasn't anybody defending any of the thing, like when we ran around and we were just, you know, taking keep after tower, after you know, supply camp, whatever, and the keep lords, they would only give a sensible percentage of the damage in order for the keep lord to actually give you loot. Because I would go in there and, you know, maybe I wouldn't be the first one through the door. And by the time I got up there, the keep lord's at half health because everybody just, you know, just unloads everything on him. And it felt like to me, you have to do at least like 5% in order to get anything. Because half the time I wouldn't even get loot if I wasn't like the first person there started spamming my skills as soon as I got up there. I, I think that um, you can level up faster in World v. World, but you'll get better loot in PvE. That seems like an and, and and you'll level up faster in World v. World if you're, I guess, doing more things. Like if you're spending four hours trying to take a single keep, I don't think you'll level up as fast as if you're taking a tower here and taking a camp there and doing more like stopping the the, the supply caravan and things like that, or defending the supply caravan. Now you did get a lot of karma in World vs. World, right? I mean you can use that to buy loot, you know, leveled loot for your character, which should be yeah. pretty good. Yep. And it scales up too. I noticed that as I was getting closer to level twenty and then twenty five, that I was uh, you'd get a lot more karma and stuff. And that, and it just it didn't occur to me until we took down another keyboard that I got like three thousand experience and six hundred, you know, karma. Whereas when I was level one, I maybe got a hundred. You know, um, I thought that was neat. So it, it 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 quelled the the worry I had in my mind that if you spend all your karma early on, that you're somehow missing out on all the items later on. But the way, it, the way it scales up, you can afford to buy all the items early on as you get the karma, and you will still have enough to do upgrades later on. And I was so glad to see that. Yeah, it's basically the the replacement for quest reward. Instead of going up to somebody and saying, thanks for bringing all my pigs back, would you like this sword or this bag? It's like, <laughs> okay, I didn't need a sword, so I'll take the bag, I guess. Uh, or, you know what, that sword sucks because I've got a better sword. You so <laughs> you miss yeah, out on I one saw, really big I thing. This. Go ahead. Well, yeah, you miss out on one really big thing when you're in like World vs. World all the time is skill points. You only yes. get them while leveling. You don't get them from doing the challenges because there's no challenges in World vs. World. So like I remember I had a utility slot, but I'm like I can't leave World vs. World because we're running around grabbing everything. But I want to get that utility field, but I don't have enough skill points, and it's just. That's the one big place I can see you falling down a little bit. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I read one world. of the devs saying that they're going to try and work on that. I don't know if that means they're going to put skill points into World versus World. I don't think that would work. Like maybe you'll get a skill point uh, depending upon like maybe certain keep lords will give skill points, but even that system sounds kind of like meh. I, I kind of like not having a World v World because I don't know because then like. You're trying to make it. What's the point of playing PVE then? Besides, I, I mean, I guess it's different play styles, but welcome um, to the dark side, Vega. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like World v World can't have everything. You can't have like skill that's the point though. They've said they've said you're supposed to be able to level up entirely in World versus World if that's what you want to do. Well, yeah, you can you can level up, but can't, can't have everything. What is this nonsense you're speaking? <laughs> what is that casual? Oh, I want the world. I want the whole world. <laughs> I, I still, I kind of disagree with you, Vega, on the point of experience, though. I, I, um, I noticed that our players that were doing PVE at, at, at the same amount of time as our World v. World players were far ahead in levels. Like Edwin in chat here, um, you know, he's he was easily the highest level we had, and he mainly did PVE uh, for the longest time. Uh, we had Ors, uh, 
who uh, NTL also did a ton of PVE, and he was always ahead of us in levels. And we did more Worldly World as far as hours spent than probably, I mean, probably twice as much than what he did in PVE. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if it's because of the public events, and then plus your personal story gives you all those well, I mean, of experience. It, it, it really depends. I, on I was told the personal story gives you a lot of experience. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, what I was basing it off of was not your personal story. Like, if you're just doing the heart quest and the the dynamic events, I feel that you'll level up. I, just going by my own experience, if you're doing Worldly World and you're doing a lot of the dynamic events that show up when you take the keep, well, not the keeps, but like the towers and the other things, <laughs> if you're doing more of those and spending not four hours trying to take a single keep, you'll level up just as fast and not faster than PvE. Is yeah. what I was Edwin says at. he only did PvE when we were losing at World v. World. Way <laughs> to be a team player. I believe they call those fair weather friends. <laughs> right, oh, team's losing. Better go play. Forward, I'll, I'll see you guys later. Have fun fighting them. Forward slash G kick. <laughs> 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 no, uh, one thing I noticed, uh, a little interesting tidbit, Bridger, is that uh, I was tracking our guild influence as it was coming in, and I wanted to blow it all on this, as many upgrades as we can get immediately, right? I wanted to get, we got the guild logo. We got the, the I got to try the catapult one time. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, not catapult, siege goal one time. And, we when our guys ran off to the PVE, we had those moments where, um, like, we basically told the raid, like, everybody take a break, you know, we'll meet back in about 30 minutes to an hour, right? And they all ran to do PVE. Some of them went to the dungeons uh, at uh, the catacombs, and then you had others that were looking for the shatterer to see if it was up. But as they were doing PVE, our influence came in at like three times the normal rate, and uh, <sighs> I don't know. You know, That's why, why we opened up quest. Division 2. You want the casuals to join to give us influence. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's just because they're questing or that every mob they kill gives, you know, guild influence. I'm not sure exactly what the actual figures are. But um, I got to hand it to PBE in that respect because if, you, if all your guild leaders out there, if you want your guild influence to shoot up so you can get all those little fancy upgrades, send them all to PBE, do public quests because that just seemed to be the trick for us. Uh, for the hour or two that we ran out there every couple of hours. I wonder if it's based on finishing dynamic events, because they use the dynamic event system in World vs. World, and if you're, like, stagnating in World vs. World because you're fighting a long, prolonged siege, right? And, you know, so you finish one dynamic event. Now, it means you take a giant keep, like, Dreaming Bay against Stiff Resistance, and it's an awesome experience, but that's only one dynamic event. You only get so much karma from it, and maybe that's sort of basing the influence, whereas maybe if you're just raiding from tower to tower to tower to tower, maybe you get more. I don't know. Did you, yeah, did that, you notice a trend? That, that, that's what I was saying, is because I think that it, because it, the, the, dyna the dynamic event in the world v. world doesn't scale for what you're trying to take, you know? Or like the because, it's really the time spent, isn't it? It's if you spend yeah. a lot more I mean, time. If, if you're ta if you spend hours trying to take a keep, you're not gonna get or your time you? your time spent. Does it for what scale you at all getting. based on how much time you've spent in the event? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell that uh, to really say because the way the influence also worked is that it doesn't uh, take immediately. It was another thing I realized that. Like, it's base. It almost seemed like it was every thirty minutes. They would then tally all the influence. So there wasn't any real way to see. Okay, we just took this keep. How much influence did it give us? Because I tried. I, I looked to see, and it didn't count it yet. Like it waits for every thirty minutes or so, and then it tallies all the influence. I just noticed that during those moments that we had our breaks and we went into PVE, like all the entire guild, uh, we got four times the amount of influence that we did if we were out doing worldly world. Yes, wow. the noble werewolf wants to know if we're all in the same guild. Yes, and it's entirely by mistake. <laughs> As I pointed out previously. She we were... kick Bridger. What? Oh, no! <laughs> it's just a coincidence is all I'm saying. Well, we, we made didn't that April Fool's show joke. all in Team Legacy. The only person from Team Legacy was Freelancer. Freelancer and then we was all the only one. Joined. It's like the Borg. <laughs> We've been he assimilated. Took, took over. <laughs> Assuming direct control. <laughs> so, last thing on World v. World, Bridger, what did you think about that uh, that clipping issue? Oh my God, that was a nightmare. We had that yeah. problem. That's what that's what started the problem in Dreaming Bay. We were all like fighting at the door, and we get reports from people at the back saying, 
oh my god, we're getting hit. And I think then I heard freelancers say, don't worry, it's just five or six of them. They can handle it. <laughs> and then I, that, I was yeah. in the middle and I turn around and we're getting steamrolled from the back and I can't even see what's hitting us. There's like five guys and we're just dropping like flies and I don't even know. I was like, what the hell's going on? And we then <laughs> apparently later realized that when we were all trying to follow freelancer, we are like, oh, well, we can't see him sometimes. <laughs> he just disappears out of existence. That's a really neat trick, Freelancer. How did you get your mesmer to do that? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty bad. You know, we have people. Uh, there's uh, some guy in chat also, but I also was asked about it on the forums. Um, you know, if there was a way that we could take advantage of that, somebody asked if you know we had tactics for that. But they don't realize that it affected us also. Like we couldn't see where people were. When I said, "All right, let's let's cut to the left, or or let's let's head to this portal, or whatever it might be," uh, it half the people couldn't see your teammates. So like you were all of a sudden like one second you saw all of your guildmates next to you, the next second you were all alone, <laughs> and there was enemies <laughs> everywhere, and you couldn't see anything at all, and uh, it was so aggravating because we ran around like for most of the weekend with about 30, 35 people, and. We split up at times, but at all times, it, every time we f we would see all of our guild members, and as soon as we came to an enemy Zerg or enemy guild, uh, it was like all of a sudden half of my guys disappear, half of their guys disappear, and it was just an AOE fest because that was the only surefire way you were going to kill That's, that's what I wound up doing. I switched to my chain lightning because I couldn't target any specific person. We couldn't do like okay, target this guy or target that guy, because, okay, well, I can't see that guy, <laughs> unfortunately. Did we try the, I don't know, did anybody try the, the target assist system in World vs. World? Did that work? Was that implemented? I mean, I thought it was implemented. I just didn't see if we played it with it at all. It was in we, there. We messed around, yeah, we, it was in there. We messed around with it, but it got to the point where we couldn't, uh, well, when TL, well, can't really go into too much detail, but, when we split up into our, our kill kill groups and we were trying to work with the assist target system, uh, it would come to the point where we got to the enemy group and the guy that we were targeting disappears. So And you lose you would, target on him, do you? You would well, you didn't lose target on him, but you couldn't see where they were either. So if you wanted to cast like a skill shot down oh, or yeah. like an AoE or something, uh, most people like myself, I opened up with Chaos Storm with the Mesmer because it does so much uh, uh, you know, boons and debuffs and all just all sorts of mess. That's it's a wonderful skill to have. <laughs> <laughs> you just cast it and like they randomly get feared and confused and everything. And uh, so I opened up with Chaos Storm, but if I pressed my assist key and I went to go target the guy, I, I didn't know where I was supposed to cast it because you couldn't tell where he was. And um, the whole uh, the whole clipping issue was so aggravating. Did we hear anything official from that in terms of fixing that, Bridger? I don't um, think we heard, I didn't read any, I don't remember reading anything official, but I'm sure that's something that basically they put into place specifically to deal with the fact that the game is not optimized yet, and on my system, I was having slowdowns in World vs. World and in the really busy parts of the cities, and my, my wife basically had no chance in the World vs. World battles. Hers was literally a slideshow. I mean, she was with us in the <laughs> Deep Dreaming Bay battle, and I'd look over to her computer, and it was like five frames a second and she was just hitting the one key and like <laughs> auto target for me game like she couldn't do anything and just imagine what it would have been like if that limit hadn't been put in there so that's why i well, think it's that was, there that it, was friday afternoon i don't th i don't think clipping was in there like as hard as bad as it was by sunday sunday evening but we had so I many more people on sunday yeah, well, I think Friday afternoon, like we had we had some pretty big battles, and there were a lot of people on well, screen you know, once, but the a, game was laggy. And the a server lot of would, people like, reported that when the server went down on Friday, when it came back up, the the frame rate was better. I wonder if they lowered the clipping limit, the number of entities on screen at any given that moment. was uh, that was my theory on Friday or Saturday because uh, I noticed that. Uh, Friday night, uh, I didn't have a lot of issues that others did, but I could see everybody, and then all of a sudden Saturday. I can't see half the enemy raid, and it, I, that was that was my big thing. Like I immediately noticed it, and I was like, you know what? I think they did, guys. They didn't so much improve the code of the game, like everybody's saying, but they made it to where they you only actually physically show so many models in front of you, and uh, that was their temporary fix to get people having smoother frame rates. And I think it was guised under the idea that it not you know most people they're not going to be running around with a thirty man group rushing against reddit with you know their 50 guys and so um you wouldn't really notice it but 
with us, we, I think most of us picked up immediately, like all of a sudden we couldn't see things. And God forbid your hunters, have, um, your rangers, <laughs> listen to me. Uh, you saw that, right? Uh, too. Have their pets out because those counted as an entity. So I could have 20 rangers in my group and the necromancers they, were worse because they would have like four. Five. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I remember on more than one occasion asking if the necromancers could do something to switch their build so they didn't have so many minions out so we could possibly see more. Um, the minions, I, I don't know, but that's a whole other tangent. I just thought they were just a complete waste in the world v. world. They were hogging my system resources. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And same with pets against doors. I mean, Rangers and necromancers with you know that relied on their pets just were like the pets just kind of like sat there and licked their paws you know and that seemed like what they were doing anyway because they were, they were useless weird. you know would it not be awesome if you could tell your pet to scale the wall or something I mean <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> but, I mean uh, somebody yeah. was pointing out like specific characters had specific skills that were really super useful in World versus World I think um, Oku posted the video of his thief using. Um, Get over here! What is that called? Scorpion wire, and oh, yeah. and the guy awesome. fell off the cliff. <laughs> like he, like this is one of those things that you're gonna use. Pull you over here, Nep. See you later, boy. He got pushed off by some other ability. It was fantastic. Uh, so things like that is, is gonna be really awesome in World vs. World, and. Jeez, we didn't even scratch the surface again. There's so much more to talk about. But we'll talk more probably about the PvE stuff next week, guys. Uh, I know we didn't cover that at all on Monday either. But uh, I think it's time to let it go. We're probably going to do some in-house League of Legends action cast by me and I drops, And we'll post a link in the channel here if you guys want to stick around. It's going to be a good time. And I think that is it for this one. Number 30, guys. Number 30. Number 30. 30. It's Very been nice. more than six months. That's scary. 30. What's going to be our feedback question, Bridger? Feedback question this week. Uh, I don't know. Let me look at my notes here. What We talked about World versus World last week. Let's talk about... Uh, let's, let's talk some strategy. I, I want to hear from all the analytical minds out there. What do you really think about the, the three corners of Stone Mess? I want to know that. You know, of, of Eternal there, Battle there's Rounds? Be, there's got to be that next Sun Tzu in chat right now that's thinking, you're so wrong, Freelancer. Blue has the greatest advantage because of this. And I want to hear it. I really do. Awesome. That's the question of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Prove Freelancer wrong. No, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, but we, I, like I want to hear, what do you think are the most strategic positions in World v. World? And then we, what we could do is share that with everybody in the next episode. I think uh, all the guilds out there will love it as well. Absolutely. Can't wait to hear your feedback. Feedback at talesofteria.com is how you can get a hold of us. And that's not just to answer the question of the week. If you guys think that you've got some discussion topic that we've missed, or if you've got a question you want us to answer, or if you just want to tell us how awesome we are, or if you want to tell us how bad we are at something and how we can fix it, constructive criticism is also well looked for at feedback at talesofteria.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a good night. See you guys. Good night. See ya.